Indeed, it is wonderful to be able to stand in amazement at how great our God is. And this privilege is ours to worship Him, to give Him the glory, as we have already done by singing and praying together. And I trust you will join me now as we open His Word and study therefrom. I know and we certainly uh, greet all of those online, those listening by conference call, that there is still much sickness and sorrow among our number here. And we love each of you. For those that are sick, we continue to pray for your recovery. And for those that are grieving, we pray for your comfort. We said last week that this time of year is, of course, a time when many people think about the birth of Jesus. While there is no mandate to set aside or to honor one day on the calendar above any other as the day in which our Savior entered the world, we should not discount the fact, nor should we fail to take advantage, that there may be some at this season that are more interested, or at least willing to listen, to think about what it means that God did come into this world in the form of a baby laid in a manger in a feed trough. And I said we would explore some of those things about Jesus from His humble beginnings and then move, if you will, beyond the manger. And I want to do that next week. But the question came, and it's a good one, also related to the events that we considered last week. Why Bethlehem? Why, according to God's Word, was His Son Jesus born in this little village that we know as Bethlehem? Now, if you turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 4 that Joseph went up from Galilee. And if you have your Bible open there and you flip over to, at least in my Bible, to the back, you'll find a map. And if you locate where the city of Galilee or the region of Galilee is, in particular uh, the city of Nazareth, that village, and you then try to find Bethlehem, you notice that you go down the page, as it were, and a lot of us, I guess, thinking about it in those terms, we think of north being up and south being down. I always heard my family members talk about going up to Michigan or up to visit family uh, somewhere in the northeast. And you read God's word when it says they went up from Galilee. It might cause you to wonder, why, why does it say up when they went down, as it were? Well, of course... It's not a reference to north or south. They went up from the region of Galilee, lower in elevation, the topography. They went up toward Bethlehem because it was higher in elevation, south of Jerusalem. They went to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was, that is, Joseph of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Now, I want you to notice that verse 6 seems to suggest a period of time between their arrival and the actual birth of Jesus. This season, of course, there has grown up so many other, I hate to call them legends, but maybe that's what they are, so many other aspects of the supposed story of what actually transpired that are really not at all in keeping with what the Bible actually records. They had been there, it seems, for a period of time. We don't know exactly how many days or weeks or months, but they are there. And then while in Bethlehem, Mary gave birth, bringing forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger, the feed trough that we talked about last week because, sadly, there was no room for them in the inn. No place for out-of-town guests to lodge and probably due to the uh, crowded nature uh, of the city, this was the best facility that could be used to welcome the Savior into the world. Verse 8, there was in the same country, that is in the same region, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, don't be afraid, for I am bringing you good tidings of great joy. I'm bringing you the best news that's ever been delivered up to this point in human history, and it will be for all people because today, today there is born for you in the city of David, that is Bethlehem, a Savior, and He is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign. Here's how you'll know you'll find Him. A baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, laid in that feed trough in the manger, 
Suddenly the heavenly host joined that angelic messenger praising God. Just as we have in one sense done it in a maybe inferior way, but to the best of our ability, uh, we join with that ancient praise and celebration. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, the angels had went back into heaven. The angels said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe. Found Jesus, the Savior, lying in that manger in the feed trough. Why Bethlehem? This is, a, of course, a picture taken uh, in the modern age. The city did not look at, as it did uh, certainly then, as recorded in Luke 2, like it does now. But that at least gives you something to put in your minds as to what uh, the city was. You see kind of the elevated knoll or hill that it's located on. But why, why Bethlehem? Now, it's of interest, uh, at least for our family, that uh, it's difficult for us kind of to, if you ask us, where's your hometown, to pinpoint it. And that is because all of our boys have a different place of birth. And this is the Chamber of Commerce picture. Uh, I just went and typed in Chamber of Commerce for each of those three locales, actually four when you add in Amy and I in a moment. Uh, you probably don't recognize these. The top left, that's Lexington, Tennessee in Henderson County, looking back uh, from the Courthouse Square toward Main Street. Uh, the top right there, that's Meridian, Mississippi. They actually have a skyscraper in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, an Art Deco building, but that's where Anderson entered the world. Uh, the other, some of you have probably visited this town square, that's Overton County, that's Livingston, where Adam came in uh, to our world. But then the bottom right, that's Jackson County, that's the Gainesboro uh, Square, the courthouse there. So where's your hometown? Uh, each of my boys might answer uh, in this way, but uh, there's something interesting about hometowns. Have you noticed? Usually when you have a hometown, you have something as you enter town telling you about its famous residents. And here, for at least Amy and I, uh, here is our claim to fame. Gainesboro is the home of Jamie Daly, who is uh, in the daily part of Daly and Vincent. Now, some of you who are bluegrass music fans know exactly who that is. If you're not a bluegrass music fan, you probably say, who in the world is Jamie Daly? Well, that's Jamie Daly, and he actually even has a sign on the square. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, that sign there if you've... Um, had an enjoyable meal at one of the restaurants that surround the square there uh, in Gainesboro, but he's what we're famous for. And um, we could tell you some stories about Jamie. He's actually very good friends with uh, Amy's brother, but uh, that's what our little town, it's claim to fame. Now, here's what I want you to think about. When you go to Bethlehem today, you don't see a sign that says, hometown of Jesus. Wouldn't that be a good sign to put up, you would think, as you entered the city to say, hometown of, or Jesus Christ born here. But you don't find that. All you find coming out of Jerusalem on the main thoroughfare is just this sign in Hebrew, Arabic, and for English tourists, of course, Bethlehem with an arrow pointing that way. Telling you if you travel five more miles to the south, you'll run into the city now of Bethlehem. Now there's a good reason why there's not a little sign underneath this one that says birthplace of or hometown of Jesus Christ. Naturally, the Jews themselves do not receive him and do not acknowledge him as the Savior. They're still looking for their Messiah, sadly and blindly oblivious to the fact that he is the one that the Old Testament promised. Two, the city of Bethlehem today is under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority and its government, certainly, but even its inhabitants and citizens of this region, by and large, are Muslim in their faith. Now, there is a We'll use the term in the broadest sense. There is a Christian segment of the city of Jerusalem and Bethlehem itself. Uh, but by and large, there is still a large contingent of Muslims and certainly even of those that observe Judaism. So there's not a sign that tells you when you arrive in Bethlehem today that you're in the birthplace of Jesus. But there are plenty of other evidences. This is Manger Square. That's the name of this particular area, Manger Square. And this is, uh, you're looking at least at one side of what is known as the Church of the Nativity. Built by Emperor Constantine and his mother, apparently she had a part to play in the process, in 328, 328 A.D., uh, they built uh, the church on this side. It was destroyed, portions of it. We're not sure what's original, what has been rebuilt by Justinian, 
Emperor Justinian in the 500s, but it's the oldest continuous operating, here's my air quotation marks, church in the world, church building in the world. And you can notice if you walk up to it, you'll find a sign that reads like this, birthplace of Jesus, church of the nativity, pilgrimage route to Bethlehem, a UNESCO cultural site. Uh, you can enter that church through what's called the door of humility, which is a very small entrance. Uh, you can descend some stairs into a what they call a grotto, and you can find there a, a star inlaid into the marble floor and then a little enclave where, at least according to tradition, and we do not know with absolute certainty whether it's the actual spot or not, but according to tradition and according to the, uh, certainly the tourist folks that want to make a lot of money off of it, that's the exact spot where Jesus was born. Now why? Why? Why was Jesus born there? Why is Phillips Brooks, uh, Phillips Brooks was a well-known preacher in Philadelphia in the uh, late 1800s. He wrote this little song uh, that is often sung this time of year. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Why Bethlehem? Uh, I, I love his words and I think they're certainly complicit with what the Bible teaches when he says, In thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years, yes, <clears throat> we're depending on uh, here the arrival of Jesus as the Savior, but still, I'm still asking the question, why? Here are some suggestions. Why Bethlehem this morning? Well, some would say there's a play on words, and God intended in our mind to make a connection on this play on words. Bethlehem, like a lot of other places that you read about, in the special, uh, especially in the Old Testament, you'll read about Beth, and then they'll have some other word attached to it to make a compound. And so you have, for instance, Bethesda. Bethesda. And uh, medical facilities are named that today, even in our country. And the word Beth is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, but this word is actually Beth, which means house. And then the compound, whatever you add to that house, uh, in this case, Bethlehem, the Hebrew word for bread is Lechem. So Bethlehem is actually the house of bread. That's what it meant. And in uh, ancient times, probably because of the agricultural abundance of that area, especially the barley that was grown on its hillsides, uh, this is where the nation's bread basket was, if you will. And so Bethlehem is the house of bread. Could it be that God says, well, let's have him born there? So that when in, in John 6, 35, and again in verse uh, 51 of that chapter, and again in actually verse 38 of that chapter, now that I recall, Jesus said on three occasions to the Jews, questioning his identity, who are you? Just tell us. He said, I'm the bread of life. Now he in that context is very curiously making a connection between what Moses gave the people as they wandered through the wilderness, the manna that came from heaven to sustain them. Jesus said, you needed that. Your forefathers depended on that for survival. But here's something more important. It's me, Jesus said. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. This morning, all of us, all of us, and even those that are not present with us, every person on the planet today needs the bread of life. They need Jesus. He's the bread from heaven. So did God mean for us to say house of bread, bread of life, and make that connection? Possibly. Here's another idea. It could be because that this little village was so important in different Old Testament events in history. In Genesis 35, we read the sad account that the uh, death of Rachel occurs. Rachel, of course, the wife of Jacob, he'll be known as Israel. He was uh, going to be the one, of course, that would have the 12 sons becoming the 12 tribes of Israel, the grandson of Abraham, and the promises that God had made would be continually worked out through his family lineage. But it says, as they arrived on the outskirts of what is Bethlehem, that Rachel prepared to give birth. And she gave birth to a son. He will be called Benjamin. But she dies. And there she is buried. And so uh, in Jewish history, this particular location is thus 
always remembered as that very important place. Even today as we take our loved ones to special places for their burial. This was her burial spot. That's a possibility. Uh, number two, there is the thought. And if you'll go back in your Bible uh, to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, you will find that that story has as its backdrop uh, the city of Bethlehem. And you will discover, just as a brief summary of that story, that you have Naomi, who is a Hebrew, a Jewish lady, leaving that area with her husband and two sons, going to the land of Moab, losing all three of the men in her family, her husband and her two sons, and returning back to Bethlehem, broken. And even taking the name, when they ask her about her experiences, she says, my name doesn't even fit anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. The Lord, the Almighty, has dealt with me very bitterly. And the story seems as if it will be a sad one. And yet chapter 2 introduces us to the fact that there is a process in Israel whereby God has made it possible for those who suffer misfortune to again be blessed through the means of a Redeemer. And you see as the story unfolds that uh, Naomi has one of her daughter-in-laws, Ruth, the Moabitess, rejoin her in the land of Bethlehem. And there they finally do come in contact with one who chooses to be their redeemer. His name is Boaz. It's a love story. I know you ladies like to read it. It is a beautiful love story between Ruth and Boaz, but also between Ruth and Naomi. But overall, it's a love story between God and His people and how God treats us as His people. And all of it plays out in Bethlehem. Now what's interesting, that particular book, Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, after Boaz performs his Redeemer duties, which included him marrying Ruth and bearing children um, in order to carry on the family lineage, in order to secure the family property, the women, Naomi's contemporaries whom she had told in chapter 1, I'm bitter. God has mistreated me is almost the indictment that she makes. Listen to her now. She said, blessed be the Lord. Actually, it's the women noting for her, and she's in agreement with them. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. Well, what's that mean? May he be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons uh, that you have borne him. So, what happens? Naomi took the child, the child of Boaz and Ruth, laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. And the neighbor women said, this, this is good news. There is a son born to Naomi and they called his name Obed. You might say, well, that, what's that guy have to do with anything? Keep reading. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. Does that ring a bell? Well, of course it does. That David is King David. That David is the David that you read about in Matthew chapter 1, as well as Rachel, Naomi, Ruth, and all of this wonderful family lineage leading up to the Savior. So maybe God is wanting us to remember this story and how God, out of tragedy, brought about a good result. Out of bitterness, brought blessing. Is that why He chose Bethlehem? Possibly. Maybe it's because this son... This one uh, that would be born of uh, Ruth, a grandson, becoming King David, this was his hometown. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we read that Samuel is sent to anoint a new king. Instead of uh, Saul, who had been king, he's sent to Jesse's house. Jesse lives in Bethlehem. And uh, as Samuel arrives on the scene, he looks at the first boy. He's the oldest. He looks the part. He's tall. He's I say tall, dark, and handsome, but probably he was. And the prophet of God says, hey, that guy looks like a king. God says, don't look at his outward appearance. Don't look at all of this. You get caught up too much in just the physical appearance. You remember that memorable statement then that God makes that's so important even for us to recall today in our dealing with people. God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He looks deeper. And so another son is brought before the prophet. God says, that's not the one either. And finally, all the boys of Jesse 
are brought in. And the prophet is told each time, that's not the one. And Samuel is confounded by uh, this entire ordeal. And he says, what do I do now, God? Is there not any other boy left to you, Jesse? And just it seems almost as a side note, he said, well, I've got another son, the youngest, but he's out keeping sheep. What's that youngest boy got to do with this process? These are the boys you ought to pick from. Call him. And that ruddy-faced, which it's difficult for us to know exactly how we should translate uh, that into English from Hebrew. Some said that he had a red complexion, maybe like a flushed complexion. Some said it means he had freckles, uh, might have had acne. I don't know what it was about David, but he's brought in and he doesn't look like a king. But God says, that's the man I want. That's the guy I want to be king, even though he's your youngest. And he is the one selected. From that point, we read in the book of 1 Samuel uh, that uh, David becomes uh, this king in training, so to speak. Saul's not willing to give up uh, the kingdom so quickly, but eventually he does. And God makes David king in his place. But even David's life is filled with heartache. Some of it, much of it in fact, due to his own poor choices. Due to his own, it seems, um, desire for things other than what God had provided. And so there is turmoil. And he is on the run from time to time. Even when he consolidates power, uh, he is still opposed by his oldest son Absalom and by others. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 23, there's just a little side note story that I want to give your consideration to before we look at the main point of the lesson. David was... On the run this time in battle with the Philistines, the enemies of God's people, the warring nation uh, that was both to their south as well as to their west on that boundary. The Philistines had a garrison. They had a detachment of soldiers in Bethlehem. And David, as some of you maybe who have served in combat away from home and away from its comforts, David said, oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. He's out with his troops. He's away from home. He's probably questioning lots of different things. And he said, if anything could comfort me at this time, I think I know what it would be. I figured I'd just have a drink of water from back home. Now for us living in the modern age, that seems like a very, maybe even a very silly request. But here his mighty men break through the camp of the Philistines. They draw water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and they bring it back to David. They said, King, this is what you wanted. Here is water from the well in your hometown. Now, I don't know what you would do if you were one of the guys that had risked life and limb to bring that water back. What your reaction would be. But David says, I can't drink that. I can't drink that. You men have risked your very own blood in jeopardy of your own lives to bring it to me. So I'm going to pour it out as an offering. I think if I'd been there, I'd say, hey man... Don't do that. Drink it. But he pours it out in order to show his gratitude. That doesn't seem to be a very grateful thing, maybe from our vantage point today. But he appreciates what these men had done just to give him a little comfort for something that had come from home. Now, is that why Bethlehem? Maybe, again, you say, well, all of these are kind of disconnected stories. And while they're intriguing and interesting and Maybe fun to kind of put ourselves in to imagine what they were like. Why? Go with me to the little prophet Micah. He's called a minor prophet because he belongs to the twelve that are shorter after the major prophets of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. And if you have to take a little while to look in the table of contents in your Bible in order to find where Micah is, I'll give you that time uh, to do that. Because we flip through and we say, I know it's in there somewhere. It's on page 1258 of my Bible. That probably doesn't help you though in yours. But this is Micah chapter 5. Micah is a country preacher. I like that about him. He's prophesying at a time when the northern kingdom especially was on the brink of destruction by the Assyrians. He lived in a time when the religious establishment had grown, uh, to use a technical term, fat and sassy. Okay, that's a really technical way of saying those who were priests and who claimed to be the spokesman for God were living high on the hog and they were telling the people whatever they wanted to hear in order to keep the money flowing. Not much different than even what we see in current uh, conditions in American religion today. But Micah will not spare. 
He will not mince his words. He will not be quiet because God had told him what to say. And he is very vocal and he is even quite obtuse in the way that he very bluntly tells these people of their wickedness and how God had even despised all of their superficial manifestations. And um, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, you probably, if you don't know any other verse from this book, you remember that one. He said, He has shown you, Micah does. He's shown you, old man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? What does God really want? Micah says, and I imagine he did not say it in a hushed volume, but he said it loudly enough for it to resound and reverberate through wherever he was speaking. He said, The Lord demands that you do justly, that you love mercy, and that you walk humbly with your God. That's still what God requires of us today, by the way. There are other commands that we have to certainly incorporate into our obedience. But if we would do those three things as individuals, as families, as a congregation, as a nation, how much better would this world be? If we would do justly, if we would love mercy, if we would walk humbly with our God. That's what Micah says God demanded then. That's still what God demands now. But Micah 5 verse 2, why Bethlehem? Read that passage with me. I hope you found it by now. Micah says, but you... Bethlehem, Arapha, that's just another way of describing that particular little region, kind of a side name for it. Though you, this little village, are little, among thousands of Judah, it belonged to the allotment of the tribe of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. What's the point? Notice Micah makes note, of, or makes note of what is obvious. He said, you are little among the thousands of Judah. This is likely his way of saying, go back and look at when Joshua divided the land and made allotment. You remember the people go into the promised land and each tribe had a particular area that God says you dwell there. And it was allotted to those families and those families were into, into per, uh, perpetuity continue to cultivate the land and to hold it. Again, that's kind of where the book of Ruth comes in, that that property had been lost through the death of those sons. And Boaz redeems, brings that property back into the family. And here, Micah says, you're little among the thousands of Judah. That is, when different places were allotted, Bethlehem is not even mentioned. Why? It was so obscure. So obscure, remote. Too important for God to use. That's what everyone would have thought by its omission. Today, do we sometimes think the same? Do we sometimes think of people or even of ourselves that my background disqualifies me from really doing anything that important or significant? Now, we've heard the stories and I like to read them too. President Jackson, President Lincoln come to mind uh, as those who were born in the dirt floor log cabins of years past but ascended uh, to the great positions of leadership within our country. Will that happen for any of us? I, I doubt it. Some of you kids, I hope if you make it big one day, maybe we'll put up a sign for you. We'll put it up right as you get off the interstate. Home of. Born here. But you see, that's unimportant too, isn't it? I don't think Micah's point is uh, that only because of its littleness or smallness did God choose to use it. That is this particular place for the birth of his son. Notice he says that there is going to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from everlasting. Only God fits that description. That is, only God is this one who from everlasting who has always been working, always been creative, always been doing that whichever God so pleases for Himself to do, His goings forth are from everlasting. But out of Bethlehem, He shall come forth. The question still remains. The question still confronts us. Why Bethlehem? Is it just because that God is trying to say there is none, no place or no person too little, obscure or unimportant for God to use? Is that the point? Uh, that's what I've often maybe made as my conclusion and deduction. But that's not where I'm going with you this morning. In fact, this morning I have one simple point. This is what the entire lesson is built toward and to. It's here. Spoken 700 years before it would happen, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and did, in fact... 
arrive in this little obscure, nondescript, non-important village of antiquity on the outskirts of Jerusalem, disregarded by most. He was born there. Why Bethlehem? Because that's where God said He would be born. Now that may sound like a very obvious thing. You say, well, that's really depressing. You mean you built up all of that just to say that? Yes, but there's a point. There's a point. And that point, reiterated here in Micah chapter 5, is repeated. From cover to cover, it would be perhaps my task, even though I'm not going to do it. I think I could show you in some form or fashion, turning to every page in God's Word, the reality of this simple concept. That what God says will be, will be. If you want me to give you some other evidence of that fact, uh, you can come with me to the Gospels. And you can find... Uh, on a number of occasions where this simple thing uh, plays out uh, without question. Uh, notice in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is nearing the end of his life. And because it is Passover season, because it is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because there were requirements uh, that the Bible says must be met, Jesus gives instructions. And he gives instructions about what was going to take place uh, as it regarded their observance of this particular day. And he said to his disciples, Go, and here's what you'll discover as it related to an animal that he would enter the city on. Later he would give them instructions about the place that they were to make preparation for the Passover. And the Bible says they went and they did it. And on every occasion, uh, for instance, in Mark uh, chapter 14 and verse 16, the Bible says they go into the city, listen to this language, and they found it just as he has said to them. Don't read over that and just say, well, okay, big deal, so what? Next verse. Jesus told them what to do. They did it, and they found it just as he said it would be. Now, what's the point for us? Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because that's where God said he would be born. Here's the question. And it's a question for this time of year. It's a question for every season of every year, every day of every year. Do you truly believe him? Now, I know that many of you are just going to dismiss that question outright and say, of course I do. I'm here, aren't I? Matthew chapter 2, we didn't read it in the opening, but you remember in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew gives a record of the arrival of Jesus and His birth. And we read that account with amazement because these individuals, identified as wise men, magi, from which we get the word magic, from the east, wherever that was, Persia, modern day Iraq or Iran, they show up in Jerusalem. And here's their question to King Herod. In Jerusalem, in the capital city, talking uh, to the man in charge, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, old Herod, we know he's a fanatical dude. And I say that with the greatest deference to the word fanatical and dude, because uh, he threatened, and not just threatened, he had already eliminated several members of his family, executing them for being rivals to his power. And he comes, sadly, with a family history of doing the same, and some of his children will duplicate uh, some of his own exploits. And so when these guys, who are at least, it appears, having some official standing, given an audience with this official, here's their question. You're in charge, or so to speak, you think you are, but we've come to worship the king of the Jews. I can't imagine how Pilate would have taken that, other than what the Bible gives me as a description of his reaction. The Bible says in verse 3, he was troubled. Troubled. It's a word that just means internal commotion. He was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. These guys would be willing to make a claim like that? Herod gathered the chief priests, the scribes of the people together. Notice verse 4, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. What did God say would happen? This is one occasion, probably one of the few occasions in Herod's life where he's really interested in what God said. But he knew this was a time when his power was threatened, when that question had to be answered. Where will the Christ be born? They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet. You see it there in your Bible? That's Matthew 2 verse 5. 
And then they give him the quotation in verse 6. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's their allusion. That's their referencing. That's their quotation of what we read a moment ago in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is what God said would happen. And Herod, at least, as much as it may pain him to acknowledge it, recognizes that what God said would happen, in fact, was it seemingly was then happening or already had happened. He calls these wise men. He says, well, you know, that star you appeared of whatever kind or nature it was, the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, we can have a lot of astronomy uh, experts kind of guess at what was going on here. That's not really pertinent to this lesson, but go. He's in Bethlehem. Why? Why could he be so confident? Is that where the star was going to go? Maybe it did continue to lead them on in that way. In fact, in verse 9, it says, It went before them till it came and stood over uh, where the young child was. But, Pilate, or, but Herod says, that's what God said would happen. And that's what did happen. The wise men do not fall to his devious plot to try to... Uh, exterminate or terminate the life of Jesus. Herod is tricked. He sees that he's been tricked. He carries out a mass massacre of those infants, just as prophecy also said would happen. But you see an implicit belief. Now, coming back to our lesson this morning, you say, that's great. That's part of the story. I, I know I recognize that. That happens this time of year. But so what? So what? Do you truly believe him this morning? And I ask that in connection with what the Savior Himself said about the gift of Himself to us. And you know it without turning there, but if you want to see it in black and white, or as my Bible and many of our Bibles are in red letters, for God so loved the world that He gave, there's the word, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a wonderful verse. What a wonderful truth. What a marvelous thing to just, in our minds, reflect on and rejoice in. Many of us have, for all of our lives, basked in the glory of what Jesus said here, His Heavenly Father did, in sending Him for our salvation. Do you believe in Him? If you do believe in Him, you should not perish, according to verse 16. But in fact, instead of perishing, everlasting life is the gift that is made possible by the gift of Jesus. So that's something worth rejoicing about. Do you believe Him? And again, everyone in this audience nods in agreement. Well, of course we do. The vast majority of residents within this county or even within this state, I would uh, venture to suppose many of them would also affirm by nodding in hearty agreement, yes, we believe in Him. Do you really believe in Him? Do you truly believe in Him? Why is it important that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Because that's where God said it would happen. Because there's a principle involved. Look in that same chapter, John chapter 3. We're really not sure. These letters are in black and white. Some say they were spoken by the forerunner of Jesus, John. But the better consensus is that this is maybe what John the Apostle writing this gospel penned later as he reflected on this occasion and this interaction between Jesus and and the Jewish teacher Nicodemus. Regardless of who spoke it, it's in God's Word, so it's inspired by His Holy Spirit, and it's worthy of our consideration this morning. And the principle that it gives us is crucial. And listen to it, please. John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That sounds like what verse 16 told us was true, and it is. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I want you to look there at that second part and notice that there is something that some of our translations miss. Others, like especially uh, the American Standard rendering here, actually get it right. When it says, does not believe on him, the word is actually, and would be tr correctly translated from Greek into English, does not obey him. What's the point? The point is, belief in Jesus demands obedience to Jesus. That's the point. The belief in Jesus that leads one to everlasting life is obedience to Jesus. Now, many today would just simply let it stop at 
belief only. If you believe, you're saved. you don't believe, you're not saved. That's true biblically if you understand what is meant by believe. That's what Mark 16, verse 16 is all about. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. The one who does not believe will be condemned. Well, it doesn't say anything about not being baptized. Well, of course not. Because if I don't really believe Him in order to obey Him, then I'm not going to be saved. In other words, I must do that which He said to do, which includes my believing in Him and obeying Him. In that case, in Mark 16, verse 16, the culminating step, as we know, is being baptized so that my sins might be forgiven and remitted. Do you truly believe Him? Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because that's where God said He would be born. What's the point? All God says is true and right. Do you believe it? From cover to cover in this word, the truthfulness and integrity and faithfulness of God is proved again and again, over and over. And that's something that most of us have cherished and treasured all of our lives. But you may be one who is doubting. Certainly we live in a time and an age even when those who say they wear the name of Jesus doubt that. And they question that. And they scratch their heads and maybe with a great uh, humility in the tone of their voice, they say, well, you know, maybe. And then they'll say something that simply violates what the Word of God says as it relates to whatever doctrine they may uh, be discussing. Maybe about sin. Well, maybe God would expand His definition of marriage, given that in modern society, we've kind of understood how things have developed down through the centuries and this and that. And Maybe, you know, that idea of just exclusively relating marriage to a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, maybe... God would be more accepting today of other alternative arrangements. But if we know God's Word, and we know that it's true, and we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem because God said that it would, and that principle remains operative, and it does, then God has already spoken. He's decided, and He's closed the book. And He said, a man leaves his father and mother is joined to his wife. A man and a woman uh, constitute God's definition of marriage. Nothing other than that. And the case is closed. Does that mean we are not compassionate or kind uh, for those who are maybe misled or confused about that? Certainly not. We are still kind. We're still compassionate. We're still loving. But loving demands them in truthfulness that we tell them that which God has said is true and right. And because God says that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And we cannot deviate therefrom. Do you really believe that? Do you believe what the Bible says uh, about sin? Do you really believe that when God says, don't do something, that's what He means? You may say, well, you know, maybe, and we keep coming back to that, maybe, or what about, or if, there are no, well, maybes, or ifs, or what abouts. If God has said not to do something, my only response in order to obey Him and to love Him is to not do it. If God tells me to do something, and I say, well, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe I can leave that undone. Maybe I can just overlook that. After all, uh, that just makes me kind of uncomfortable to really do that. I, I know God said to do it, but you know, may, there's no maybes. There's no whatabouts. There's no ifs. If God says to do it, I must do it. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because that's where God said He would be born. What does that prove? Whatever God says is the way that it is. Now, believing that Jesus is God's gift to many is what many might affirm they are doing. And you know those people, and I know those people, and uh, we love those people. We work with them. We, uh, you know, go to school with them. We live with them. We, uh, whatever. We, we love those people. But especially this time of year, we need to just simply maybe help people. What does this really mean? You say you believe Him. You say you believe Him. And you rejoice with the thought and the idea that God came among us in the form of a baby in Bethlehem. Well, that's wonderful. But you believing that must mean that you obey Him. Because He's more than a baby in a feed trough. He's now the Lord of Lords and He's now the King of Kings. As I said, we'll explore that at length next week. But know this, the one who believes in the Son has everlasting life. The one who does not obey Him does not see life, but the wrath of God abides on Him. Does that describe you? Do you really believe what He says? You say you do, but does it show by the obedience that you render to Him. Tonight we'll talk about a big word, and I'll go ahead and preview it for you. It's vengeance. 
what does it mean that God shows vengeance? Well, that's what Jesus uh, or John, whoever spoke these words in John 3, 36, is reminding us of. We have a choice, and it's a very simple choice, really. Do we believe and obey, or do we not believe and disobey? You can't have any combination of the two. You can't say, I believe, and yet not obey, else you don't truly believe, because you don't truly obey. Believing in Him, this gift that He is for us as our Savior, means that we obey Him. So this morning, believe what He says. Believe what He says about sin, about the gospel, about temptation, about sin, about family, about struggles, about worry, about eternity, about salvation. Believe that. But believe that by showing it in your obedience to that. What does that mean? We've looked at it already, but the Savior Himself said, If you believe me and are baptized, you will be saved. Certainly the book of Acts continues to fill out those steps in that process where hearing that message that He is the Savior uh, causes us, upon hearing it, it should, according to Romans 10, 17, produce faith in our hearts. And that faith and that belief prompts me uh, to continue uh, to ask, what is it that my Lord would have me to do? Well, if I believe on Him, I'll turn my life over to Him. I'll change the way that I live. I repent. I let Him have control of my life instead of selfishly uh, choosing to live as I please, I'll confess Him, both by my words and my actions, that I believe He is my Savior, and then I'll die with Him. And then there'll be that location that I acquire. You see, we think about Jesus born in Bethlehem. That's a physical location. And that's where Jesus entered our world, in this little obscure village. Whether it be in a, a stable, in a cave, or wherever, uh, that's where the Son of God was placed, a humble beginning for sure. But that's a location. Spiritually, our greater concern this morning must be, where am I? Am I in Christ? And only by taking those steps of obedience uh, of the gospel in which I am born again, dying to sin, Romans chapter 6, buried with Christ into baptism, am I placed into Him? And into that location spiritually is where all spiritual blessings are found where forgiveness and salvation is found. Do you believe Him this morning? Will you, if you do believe Him, obey Him? As children of God, do, do we really believe Him? And this is something that I admit. Uh, I can be honest enough to say with great sadness and shame somewhat, but to say that in my life I can see occasions when I say I believe Him and then not do what He says. And maybe the question that Jesus asked those who were following Him or thought they were following Him in Luke chapter 6, it's a penetrating question, and he didn't say it with a smirk, and he didn't say it laughing. He said it with great soberness. He said, why do you call me Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And maybe there was a tinge of sadness in his tone. Maybe there was heartache written on his face, and sorrow in his eyes as he turned to these individuals who professed their allegiance, but it was so shallow and so superficial. And I wonder how often he looks at my life and with that same sorrow and heartache sees nothing but maybe a shallow and a superficial, you call me Lord, but are you doing what I say? As children of God, let us answer that question with the utmost seriousness this morning. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? That's where God said he would be born. What's the lesson for us? It's a simple one. What God says will be, will be. So in view of your standing before him, even of eternity now, Consider that question and answer it, and if need be, make changes to your life and come while we stand and sing together.